Well, aloha and good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in here on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanju Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertisery. Thank you so much for turning in here this morning. And Yanji, uh, we are going to be focusing on a conversation that has certainly made headlines over the past few months, and that is regarding tourism. That's right. There's so much debate right now about the level of tourism that Hawaii can sustain. And a big part of the conversation, of course, is the Hawaii Tourism Authority. The legislature made some big moves in changing the funding mechanisms there, along with how much money that agency is getting. So joining us now is the CEO and president of the HTA, John DeFries, joining us live from his office. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Let's start with some basics. You know, everywhere we go, we feel like it's suddenly busy, but are the tourists really back? You know, the tourists are back this summer. I will tell you that between January and the, and all through May, uh, oddly enough, arrivals were down about 50% when you compare it to uh, calendar year 2019 pre-pandemic. It feels like much more because not all of our activities, not all of our commercial centers, not all of our hotels have reopened to full capacity. And so those places that are open are where everyone's congregating. So you have this sense that uh, these arrival numbers are now exceeding 2019. I will tell you though, that from mid June through uh, August, we're going to see visitor arrivals primarily from the United States that will equal to or exceed what we experienced in the summer of 2019. Well, let's also focus in on how uh, the, some of the changes that have happened to HTA over the past few weeks uh, with uh, the legislature and their override of Governor Ige's veto on a measure that changed the funding mechanism for the agency that you uh, manage. Talk to us about how some of those changes uh, will impact the overall uh, organization of the HTA and your ability to move forward. Sure. So the... Um... Uh, Bill 862 actually took away the, the dedicated funding source, which was TAT. Uh, and in its place, uh, the legislature has assigned ARPA, or federal recovery dollars, there. The annual uh, appropriation of $79 million that this agency once received was now reduced to $60 million. And then 16.5 to operate the convention center was reduced to 11 million. Uh, the tourism special fund, uh, which gave us much flexibility in how we could fund things uh, has been suspended. And we are now subject to the state procurement uh, proceedings, procedures, as well as federal procurement compliance. Uh, so those are the major structural changes. I will tell you this, that once uh, 862 was overridden and became law, I have a responsibility to align this agency and the entire team behind that law. Uh, this is We have been doing that. Our procurement and financial people have been diligent in taking their courses that are required as part of the federal procurement uh, process. So. Uh, we will comply uh, and make this work. And in making that work, what is lost when you have budget cuts of that magnitude? Uh, what, what changes in your ability to do your job and what gets left behind? Sure. You know, um, what, what across the board, so we're looking at roughly a 24% reduction in budget. And so we are, and, and typically we would have received a fiscal year budget approval from our own board in the month of May. But because of this pending legislation, we've now been pushed back. Going into tomorrow's board meeting, uh, the board will start to look at our proposal uh, for it. But you can sense that uh, every line item in some way will be affected. And, and in the use of ARPA dollars, we're having to test whether or not everything that we have funded in the past, cultural festivals, sporting events, things that contribute to the brand identity of Hawaii, we are not, as we sit here right now, we are not uh, clear about whether all of them will meet the federal standard. So the answer to your question is this is a work in progress and, uh, and we'll give it our best shot, but we're going to have to test 
the federal system to see if all of these uh, events, projects, and initiatives stand the test uh, of compliance with the federal standards. Another major change has been the way in which the TAT is managed and the abilities for the counties to receive portions of that and them now having the authority uh, to receive their own up to 3% uh, portion of TAT. Uh, wanted to get your take on how you think that will ultimately impact uh, the visitor experience overall and just the overall cost for a vacation in Hawaii and also the cost that that could also mean for local residents. Sure, so the, the immediate um, impact is that the counties have been without TAT for this year, right? And then for a full year, now that they've been authorized to create their own TAT, this will open up a public process. And at minimum, I would have to estimate that it's going to take them at least one year, additional year, and possibly a second year before they can reconcile this legally um, uh, to create a tax that they can actually implement. Let's presume that they, um, the counties go for the maximum authorization of 3%. When a visitor, mainland or local, checks into a hotel and that tax has been implemented, there will be a 10 and a quarter percent for the state TAT. There will be a new 3% for the county TAT. And on top of that, there will be the GET tax, right? So we at that point will be at like 17 and a quarter percent, right? And again, this is applicable to um, a visitor from the mainland or a visitor coming from the neighbor islands, Kamaina travelers as well. So I know that the counties, I understand why the counties are forced to do this because they're being impacted by the, the presence of visitors and need to recover some of those costs. I want to ask you a little bit about HTA's core function there, you know, in the lead up to the, the, the measures that the legislature took, there's been a conversation about, um, you know, people saying, well, H uh, Hawaii doesn't need to advertise. And that's borne out by the number of visitors. We already see this pent up demand. Hawaii is, you know, de one of the top destinations. What is your response to that? And, and what do you think the core function of your organization should be? Because Scott Psyche on this program, along with others, have said that that really needs to be reevaluated. You know, um, I would encourage all of the legislators to read the current strategic plan, which was adopted uh, in January of 2020, like six, eight weeks before the pandemic hit. And unfortunately, that plan got caught up in all the turmoil that followed and was never properly introduced to the public, to the visitor industry, much less to the legislators. I, I am encouraged by some of the comments I hear from the legislators, even the ones that were advocates of 862, because what they are actually advocating is consistent with what you will find in the strategic plan. That plan adopted in January 2020 was on the heels of a full calendar year 2019, where HTA staff and its consultants went to every island to listen to what the concerns were about tourism. And again, this is in calendar year 2019. The byproduct of that is a strategic plan that has four pillars, natural resources, Hawaiian culture, community and community well-being, and branding, okay? And, and what, that what that recognizes is a holistic understanding of the industry. Believe me, three decades ago, those four pillars would have been hotels, airlines, rental cars, restaurants. The recognition that the natural environment needs to be protected, Hawaiian culture needs to be advocated and made an, a central part of the brand identity of Hawaii, and that the community well being uh, needs to be made a priority is the foundation upon which HTA is now conducting itself. So, Actually, the, the, the speaker's comments are very much in line with that, uh, and I look forward to having more conversations with him about that. Let's focus in on some of those pillars because we know that right now there seems to be a growing disconnect with local residents and visitors. Of course, uh, we're seeing what's happening over social media. 
uh, many people who are uh, upset with the way in which tourists are acting uh, when it comes to things like the treatment of monk seal. We're seeing the desecration of certain areas that are sacred to native Hawaiians. Uh, wanted to get your take on where the Hawaii Tourism Authority sees its role in helping to manage that and helping to educate those visitors entering our islands. Sure. And let me just say bad behavior by the visitor, bad behavior by a local resident, zero tolerance, right? They, they, they absolutely have no right to be uh, interacting with our wildlife like that and, and being less than respectful to places that are special or sacred. So let me get that out of the way. But let me also tell you this, that what we also learned during the pandemic is how critical the relationship between all state agencies and all county agencies are to the successful management of tourism. I will tell you that the weeks here in this office, much of it is spent with interacting with the heads of Department of Transportation, Department of Health, the airports division of transportation, uh, DLNR, uh, because in order to manage an industry of this scale and this magnitude requires the collaboration of all of these agencies who have not only core missions in, in that activity, but actually uh, are responsible for managing, whether it's our coastal areas, our beach parks, our mountain trails, and so, so much of our work in, in establishing a management plan is really in the coordination between interagencies and the collaborative ideas that result to help resolve some of these problem areas. I wanna bring in some of the audience. Krista has a question here. She says, she says, the plan indicated improving resident views on tourism because positive opinion on tourism has been decreasing. Why isn't reducing or managing tourism the priority, not improving resident opinions? I wonder, you know, during the pandemic, just to build on her point here, uh, there was a lot of talk about a tourism reset and that we would attract a new kind of visitor, a higher spend, perhaps fewer people. That's clearly not happening at the moment. But in your view, what does managed tourism actually look like? Sure. Well, I think we touched on it uh, in the previous segment or, or the previous statement I made that Managed tourism is a, a well-integrated system of agencies that have to come together because the jurisdiction of the areas that our visitors impact are multi-jurisdictional, right? So you're moving out of a coastal area into a mountain zone. You're moving out of airports into a resort zone. All the time you are like crossing and, and entering a different jurisdiction. And so managed tourism requires that type of integration with community leaders, the private sector, our hotel and industry partners, as well as the public sector agencies at both the state and county levels. And it comes down to uh, no one agency uh, has that mass jurisdiction or universal jurisdiction as a result we are responsible for creating that collaborative set that can resolve these problems and better manage the flow of visitors as they come. You know, as we see it now, as you mentioned earlier, that we could see some of those record numbers once the report and numbers come out for uh, this year, or especially for the last few months that have happened. And we have to take into account that that does not include some of our biggest markets, including Japan and those from the Asian markets. Are you at all concerned that once things reopen and we begin seeing uh, those Japanese visitors that we saw uh, really help to lead the tourism industry uh, when they arrive to the islands, in addition with the record numbers that we're seeing from the U.S. mainland, that there might be just even more tourists here on uh, our, our shores and in our islands that may that the state's infrastructure may not be able to handle the amount or the influx of visitors that may potentially be on the horizon? You know, that's always a concern, but I, but I will tell you that part of what we're experiencing here uh, is attributed to the fact that about six, seven weeks ago, the Center for Disease Control put out a travel advisory to all Americans, essentially cautioning them about not going to 80% of the world. Stay out of China, stay out of Korea, stay out of Japan, Southeast Asia, Oceania, Canada, 
Europe was beginning to open and it faltered in certain areas. Stay out of Mexico, right? So when you have all those other competitive destinations that are shut down, Hawaii looms as this bright jewel in the Pacific to the U.S. market, okay? As the other world destinations begin to open and remobilize and global competition returns, you're going to see, I believe we're going to witness a stabilization of and a redistribution of where Americans choose to go and where the international traveler chooses to go. I will say that once Japan lifts their travel restrictions, we can expect um, a tremendous response from Japan here. But I see this stabilizing itself over the next four to six months and, and not have this collision of markets um, resulting in something that we cannot control. You know, the mayors on several islands, actually all islands, uh, have talked about increasing user fees, not for Kama'aina, but for visitors. You know, we saw uh, Hanauma Bay go to $25 a head, and they're talking about uh, other places where there are natural sort of entry points, some of our, you know, beaches and whatnot, that's just not possible. But there are natural entry points to increase user fees. For example, uh, Mayor Kawakami on Kauai says that he doesn't necessarily want tourist camping, that he would like to really jack up those prices so that that's really Kama'aina and kind of push the tourists to the hotels. What are your thoughts on user fees on all the islands uh, to kind of control some of this, the flow of tourists, if you will? Sure. So, you know, what we have in common with all of the mayors um, is they're all Kama'aina, right? And, and, and what I enjoy about all of them is they're unique to their island and they are an extension of their own community. So there is, a as a Kama'aina, there is a natural tendency to want to protect not only your community, but the natural settings that are there. And, and I do think that when visitors are uh, impacting certain areas, User fees are appropriate. I think Hanama Bay is looming as a, uh, an example. Uh, Hyena on Kauai is another example. And so I think when the user fee is optional, so I as a visitor can choose to, if I choose to go there, I have knowledge that I have a fee to pay, right? I, I think that that differs from when fees are imposed uniformly, where I as a, a traveler uh, do not have the option, I'm mandated to do it. So I think, you know, I trust the fact that the mayors will make prudent decisions and, and do what's best, not only for their island, but they all know how important tourism is to their island's community. And that these kinds of fee, uh, when you start imposing fees, you've gotta be remain sensitive to what uh, price sensitivity might be, but but I have the confidence that these mayors will be prudent in how they apply that. Another issue that has been spotlighted during this pandemic has been the lack of rental car availabilities. And we're seeing uh, some of those prices that tourists, as well as Kamaaina, are having to pay to rent the car because of that shortage. Uh, there are some leaders in other counties who say they simply just don't want to see that influx of rental cars uh, taking up space or, or really congesting some of the smaller roadways that we see, especially on the neighbor islands. Uh, what are your thoughts on the expansion of shuttles or hotel tour buses of that sort to help to cut back and minimize the rental cars uh, on the roadways? And if you can speak to just the overall shortage and if that is something that continues to concern you as visitors return to the islands. Sure, so, you know, I think to underscore that, that question, I think we have to understand that in the last 15, 16 months that we've all been dealing with this pandemic, that businesses and an industry, tourism, has been injured, okay? Well, you cannot experience an economic collapse, a market collapse, a global pandemic, and not in some way um, be impacted adversely and injured, right? So the reopening of this, is as much about healing our own businesses and allowing that time for it to recover. Rental cars, right? They, they had to make a tough business decision to, to basically sell off their fleets because of the uncertainty that all of us were con confronting nine, 10, 12 months ago. So, and then all of a sudden, the, you take the rental car problem, goes all the way back to the manufacturers 
and unable to re restore the rent a car fleet uh, on a timely basis. In the meantime, to make up that void, uh, HTA has been involved with the counties and, and the visitor bureau chapters to try and come up with solutions around uh, motor coach shuttles. You have an increase in ride sharing uh, activity and entrepreneurs who are now driving for one or both, you know, Uber and Lyft. So I think, you know, out of this, there are going to become alternatives, but I'm also well aware that we live in a free enterprise system and businesses, every rent a car agency is going to have to make an individual assessment about what they believe um, is the right thing for their car company, right? But there are going to be more op opportunities and options available to visitors local and mainland uh, and out of state uh, going forward that um, I'm hopeful can offset uh, the rental car traffic that we experienced back in 2019. Um, there's a question here. Oh, here we go. From Nani Aloha it says, who is sensitive to the ratio of tourists to residents? When is enough enough? You know, before the pandemic, we were approaching over 10 million tourists a year throughout the islands. Is there a magic number that is appropriate for us? Uh, you know, as we talk about that tourism reset, what should the target be in that regard? You know, the, um, the growth from 8 million to 10 million visitors came without one additional, one net additional hotel room being available. So where did those 2 million go, right? And in, in some cases, they ended up in illegal uh, vacation rentals. And I know, and I'm encouraged by the, the diligence with which each of our county mayors now sees that as part of the solution to, re, to take that illegal inventory away. And in, in a couple of weeks, I believe Mayor Blangiardi uh, and his uh, Department of Permitting and Planning will be introducing uh, their approach to it. So I won't jump the gun there, but, but getting that inventory out of the system is going to lead to a reduction in, in visitor accommodations being available. And I, I think that that is priority number one. You know, the, the magic number, let me tell you on every island I get asked, can you cap the number of air seats into our island? And, um, and people are often disappointed to learn that embedded in the US constitution is the freedom of its citizens to be able to move interstate. So the answer is that we cannot control that number, okay? All we can do is continue to discuss this priority with the airline executives um, and see if we can collectively come to an agreement about how we can better manage the flow so that even during the valley periods where visitor traffic is not as intense, that we can begin to move some of that into those valley areas. But um, at the moment, we do not have a magic number. What we do know is that we do not have the systems in place. We do not have the infrastructure in place. We do not have a massive reservation system that can manage the flow of people to handle 10 million. At the beginning of the show, you talked about some of those cuts uh, to your department. One of the areas that you specifically mentioned was a cut to the Hawaii Convention Center uh, and the overall funding that's gonna be happening in, in that area. How do you think that that uh, cut in funding in that area will impact the ability for Hawaii to host large conventions and uh, its ability moving forward. How important will that sector of that market of, of conventions be to the overall recovery? You know, to the credit of the legislature, they preserved the convention center uh, special enterprise fund. Okay, so the special fund for the convention center uh, is still in place and still uh, functional for us. So what that means is we are able to carry over savings from uh, past years going forward. So we will be adequately funded um, for the convention center for the coming fiscal year. And we are slowly beginning to ratchet up the, um, the marketing efforts because Part of your question earlier had to do with the desired visitor, the higher spender. 
the lower impact visitor, right? And that conventions market, meetings market, is representative of that desired traveler. Typically, not as many rent a cars because they're moving as groups. They're tied up in sessions here at the convention center. So they're not out and about on a daily basis. And, and so we will continue to put our energy there. But, but in answer to your question, going into fiscal 22, we, are, uh, we will be fully allocated at the uh, convention center and grateful for it, frankly. You know, we're almost out of time, but I want to circle back to something that Ryan had mentioned, which was this tension that we see between Kamaina and the visitors. How do we make it so, you know, one of the things we traffic in, of course, is Aloha and that we need to make sure that our visitors, you know, enjoy their experience here. But there are a lot of people who felt like the pandemic was this reset. They got their beaches back. They got their favorite hiking trails back. And they don't necessarily want to go to where we seem to be going right now. What do you say to those residents who just feel a little bit overwhelmed right now? Sure. Listen, I got my beaches back. I got my forest trails back. So I understand the euphoria, right? Back in January, uh, September, standing on Waikiki Beach when it was empty. So I understand that local sentiment very well. And, and I have the debates within my own family uh, about this, okay? I will say this, and I use this in describing the system of tourism, okay? Imagine that the system of tourism, not the people in it, but the system is like the plumbing in your house, okay? You turn the plumbing off in your homes for 15 months. When you turn that back on, I wouldn't drink the first water, okay? And so we have to flush this system out completely, allow it to heal, allow it to build its capacity. But to the point about uh, the tension, um, I would just encourage our local people to, um, to take every opportunity to first educate the visitor, okay, on what appropriate responses, what appropriate behavior is. I would avoid violence and conflict, okay? And I would ultimately treat the visitor like you wanna be treated. Now, I know that in some cases, okay, especially when we're dealing with the American, uh, the U.S. market. You and I know that this is not the same America. Over the last three or four years, America has become extremely fragmented by its politics, by the pandemic, simple whether we wear a mask or not wear a mask. And this whole, at, it's, it's bred an attitude that is not conducive to proper behavior. And that, that segment concerns me more. But I would just encourage our, our local community to use every opportunity you have to try and educate the visitor because visitor education has become the primary mission at HTA. And it's nonstop. And when you're dealing with changing human behavior, um, you know it's tough. Think about all the people that you know in your life who still smoke cigarettes, right? And, and how long we've been trying to counsel that on a health basis. So our work is cut out for us. And, and believe me, I appreciate uh, the community uh, responding the way they have. Um, you know, before we go, I, I did want to just ask you one final question. You know, you've kind of just come into this role uh, recently, uh, not even a year yet. Uh, and as for someone like yourself, as a native Hawaiian and having to navigate uh, this agency uh, during this time, when, as we said, there seems to be even more growing contention between local residents and that of the industry. Uh, how do you balance that with just the principles and morals that you have been raised in, being born and raised in these islands, being a native Hawaiian and having to lead an industry that means so much to the state, yet uh, there seems to be a, a lot of criticism and, and a lot of discussion over how it's managed? You know, um, for all the reasons you just mentioned, a year ago, when I made the decision to become an applicant for this position, uh, my wife and I and, and close family members went through the whole dissertation. So I am exactly where I thought I would be. Um, I knew that coming out of this would not be elegant, would be tough, uh, that that this, this balancing act um, is like unprecedented, right? But um, I'm also encouraged by the fact that the different people I work with every week in different agencies, different islands, 
have one thing in common. We all carry Kamaina that want what's best for Hawaii, right? And so to the degree that we can influence a shift in tourism, which I'm intent on being a part of, um, you know, I, I, I knew that this would uh, be this challenging and I wouldn't want to be anyplace else right now. Okay, John DeFries, thank you so much for joining us this morning and guess, giving us an update on the landscape of tourism in their islands and the uh, update on your agency that you manage. We thank you so much uh, for spending your time with us this morning. We'll do this again because it's going to be exciting going into the fall. We certainly You're always to that. welcome. Thank you, <laughs> thank thank you so you. much. Aloha. Aloha. Ryan, uh, very interesting to hear his thoughts on, you know, that analogy that he drew about the plumbing and that basically this is sort of a system reset and he's predicting really more of a stabilization that we're not going to see this continued climb, that things are going to sort of calm down, which I'm sure is reassuring for many people watching because they do feel a bit overwhelmed. He said that he sympathizes and he understands those feelings. Uh, one of the things that he highlighted was all the county mayor's plan to uh, really crack down on illegal vacation rentals. We've heard Mayor Blanchiardi talk about a plan in the works that he plans to unveil soon, he says, uh, to really do uh, up enforcement of the illegal vacation crackdown. So we'll see if that comes to pass. And if it does, we could see those numbers sort of shrink down, pushing folks back into hotels and away from uh, residential neighborhoods. Yeah, and certainly interesting to hear his take on how the overall changes that were made uh, at, during the legislative session uh, and the legislation that has been passed that changes the funding mechanism for the Hawaii Tourism Authority ultimately will impact the agency that he has been put in charge of. Uh, also getting his thoughts on how the TAT and the restructuring of that will be impacted to the county levels. Uh, and, and interesting to hear that his prediction of saying that it could take up to two years to get this thing uh, organized and managed now that this mechanism for receiving and structuring the TAT at the county level still needs to go uh, through public debate and needs to go through all the necessary channels uh, in that matter so that counties could be without that TAT funding for maybe two years. Of course, they're missing out on this year. Uh, and so all of those things have to be taken into consideration when you're looking at the overall budget for each county and how that will be managed moving forward. Certainly something that uh, the mayors as well as the AG's office and state departments are looking into to see how they can maybe expedite that process, but also how they manage that overall. Uh, and also interesting to hear his take on when uh, how he thinks things will ha uh, ultimately be impacted here in the islands once travel to those big Asian markets reopen and how there may be more of a distribution overall. Right, that the visitor market is not guaranteed because essentially they're being funneled here because they can't go anywhere else. So that was interesting to hear. Um, of course, what affects all of this is the pandemic and the rise of the Delta variant and the case counts here in the islands as those numbers go up. Of course, that could threaten this industry uh, and much more. And so we are going to be talking with Dr. Libby Char on Friday uh, about where the virus is, about what she predicts for schools. We know that school starts on August 3rd for most public schools. Schools. Some are back already, but uh, that's the sort of big opening day, if you will. And uh, we're going to be talking to her about the Delta variant, about hospital capacity. Does she think that we need new restrictions? Uh, you saw the president today saying that uh, federal workers should be mandated to have vaccinations or testing. So uh, there's a lot going on when it comes to the pandemic. And we'll be talking about all of that with her on Friday. Looking forward to that conversation. We thank you for being a part of today's conversation. And we'll see you right back here on Thursday at 1030 for another edition of Spotlight Hawaii. Aloha. That'll be Friday. Aloha. Friday. Aloha. <laughs>